right. Hey, everybody. How you doing out there on this uh, really, really snowy day where I am in Ottawa? But if you're in Ontario or generally any, uh, you know, like New York or Buffalo or anything, you got a pretty snowy day out there. Spent a couple, uh, well, almost two hours anyways already. Uh, round one, shovel and snow today, but uh, that's not keeping us down. It's also a special episode of the show today, special for me anyway, because it is my birthday. And so I'm going to be celebrating with one of these buttes, uh, the Vesper Martini. Yeah, I've been saving this one because I knew the episode was going to be filmed on this day, um, and I wanted a nice classy drink for my birthday. So if you don't know what the Vesper Martini is, perhaps you've heard uh, of James Bond's penchant for martinis and how he prefers them shaken not stirred. So this is the original recipe for the drink that I'm going to show you how to make um, as it first appeared in Ian Fleming's 1953 classic introduction to the great James Bond character uh, Casino Royale. So before we talk about music today and we are going to talk about music specifically um, how I got into it and my influences and how it came to where we are today. Um, I'm going to show you how to make one of these so we can sip on that together and enjoy the day, um, the snow day or whatever it is. So when this comes out, maybe there's still some left. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. So cheers. Let's do that. Hey guys, on today's special rock and roll bartender segment, and it's special because it's my birthday, um, I'm going to be doing a classic gin drink, and it's a classic in the sense that it's made popular and invented um, by one of the most famous fictional characters in cinema of all time. That's right, the Vesper Martini, done other than James Bond himself's creation. Of course, really the creation is Ian Fleming, the author, um, and it first appeared in 1953's Casino Royale, the novel. So this drink I've been saving for a little while to show you guys in January because well, it's a special occasion for me, and I wanted to celebrate with uh, one of my favorite uh, TV characters, movie characters of all time. But also, this drink's got a really booze-heavy kick to it, and uh, well, today, um, where I am, it's pretty much a snow day. The, the province seems to be shut down with snowstorms. I've already spent a couple hours inside myself doing some shoveling, and now I feel like having a martini. So, without further ado, as I usually like to say, uh, this one's real simple but it's really strong, so I'm gonna show you what you need. You need gin. Now, the first thing you're gonna want is to make sure that you pick a quality gin. Don't cheap out on the gin in this one. Um, typically, it's made with a London Dry, so, but realistically, because gin is the main spirit in this drink, uh, you're gonna wanna make sure it's a gin that you like the taste of on its own, because there's three ounces of gin in this drink. So I'm using Hendrix Lunar today, um, I generally really like what Hendrix does, but uh, the Lunar one's not quite as uh, herbal as their normal one, and I feel it blends a little bit better for this kind of drink. Uh, you're going to need vodka, realistically. Um, I personally don't think it really matters what kind of vodka you use, um, because the gin is really taking over the drink. And you're going to need Lille Blanc. Now, this is an interesting beverage because it's essentially it's a wine-based aperitif and you're only using a little bit just to accent the flavor a little bit but uh, one of the things is if you get drinking these James Bond martinis after you open a bottle of this you got four weeks to drink it so find something else you like with the Le Blanc uh, there's a recipe I think that comes on the bottle even for like a spritz that you like because otherwise you're going to be pretty hammered um, drinking these drinks because they are very strong so how do we make it? well got your ice shaker now, uh, a lot of martinis are not shaken, they are stirred. But as we know, James likes his martinis shaken. So you're gonna need a cocktail shaker full of ice. Uh, shaken, not stirred, the line there. And I have to assume that uh, that line comes because this drink is four and a half ounces of straight alcohol. That's enough to put uh, a lot of people in a pretty buzzed state. Um, but when you shake the drink with ice, it kind of dilutes the flavor a little bit and takes um, the boozy kick away. Uh, it doesn't really because, again, it's still pretty strong. But if I was being, you know, if I was guessing, I would say that's probably why the drink is preferred shaken as most martinis you would stir instead of uh, tradition. So, an ounce of vodka, if you just saw me put that in. So we have our four ounces. I'm going to top it off there. Just half ounce of this 
Lille Blanc for a little bit of extra flavor. And that's it. We got a cocktail shaker full of ice, three ounces of gin, one ounce of vodka, and we shake. Uh, now, I just took this martini glass out of the fridge. So if you don't, you can chill the glass by putting it in the fridge or freezer, or putting some ice in there with some water, just to chill the glass a little bit. Give it a good shake, make sure it's nice and chilled. And we strain. As you can see, um, this glass, uh, depending on the size of the martini glasses you're using, like to, I generally like making martinis in like coupe style glasses, Nick and Nora's. Um, but this one's four and a half ounces, and those really small glasses, uh, they won't fit this drink. So a traditional martini glass is generally what I would use for this. And last but not least, it's typically made with a fairly large bit of lemon peel dropped directly into the drink. Now I know in a lot of photos you'll see you know, twists and everything on the side, and I'm gonna twist this a little bit, but realistically, you just want the peel of the lemon dropped in the center of the drink to give it a little bit of that uh, lemony note to it. And voila, there you have it. One of the most famous cocktails by one of the most famous movie characters of all time. The James Bond classic, the Vesper Martini. So let's do the music part of the podcast on this birthday edition of From the Pros. Okay, we are back. We've got our Vesper Martini, the James Bond classic drink. Uh, mm, that is a birthday gin delight for me in hand. And we're going to talk a little bit today about how I got into music. Guitar specifically, because while some of you might know me as the front man of this band, um, this is the only time I have ever been a singer. Ever. I've always been known for my uh, work on the fretboard. And... 21 years ago today, my birthday, was the first time I ever bought a guitar. And let's talk a little bit how that happened. So the story starts with my brother, actually, two years younger than me. And I was never really into music. Like, I hated music class. I don't know how to read music. I'm trying to get better at it. That's what that's for. That's why I bought that piano. And, uh, you know, learning how to compose and everything. It's kind of like learning a new language. So it takes some time and practice and dedication. But like anything, you get out of it what you put into it. So the more you work, the better you get. And I already have a strong basis, obviously. I've been playing guitar for, well, two decades. Uh, but it is a fun process. But I never liked music. Aside from just listening to it, I never liked playing it. I was tasked to play an alto saxophone in grade seven and eight. Um, and I hated it. And then our teacher had a heart attack and we didn't have a music teacher. And so I didn't even have music class till I was in grade four. So literally no musical background whatsoever. Didn't care for it. But my brother wanted to get a guitar and my dad rented one for him. And it kind of just sat on the couch. You know, he was into a lot of stuff at the time, sports and everything. And it, I guess it just didn't take to him or he didn't take to it. But it sat there and I'd see it every day after school. It was just sitting on the couch and well, I started to pick it up and it turns out I really liked it. A month later, my birthday rolled around and uh, well, I bought a guitar with all the gift cards, you know, birthday cards and money and money I already had from working. And there you go, 14 years old, I got my first guitar and my identity completely changed. Um, the quiet nerdy kid uh, over the next two years quickly changed into the guitar guy. Everybody uh, knew me as a guitar guy. I played a lot. Like I would come home from school and I would play guitar for three or four hours every day. Uh, you know, they say, play till your fingers bleed. Well, I remember doing that, actually. I did play till my fingers bled. You know what? It's actually not a good idea because then you got to let them heal and you can't play guitar for a while, so don't do that. Point is, I became pretty obsessed. But how, how did I learn? I was self-taught for the most part. I took four guitar lessons, enjoyed it. I had a great instructor, but uh, I, I couldn't afford them. 
You know, like they, they were expensive for a guy who's only 14 and trying to pay with his part-time job. So I also thought, you know, I could probably figure this out. And I started just jamming by ear. Listen to something. Get it right off that. And when I went to uh, guitar class, which was a class in grade 10, uh, a new class at the high school I was attending. And it was taught by our music teacher, but also by like some pretty good guitar players in, in the, the high school. And the one guy who was phenomenal, like he was obsessed with Steve Vai and Joe Satriani and those type of guys. So he knew what he was doing. But he brought in this loop pedal one day and it could loop. You could play uh, eight seconds or 16 seconds up to uh, a riff on your pedal and then it would play it back and just loop it. And you could play over top of it. Game changer for me and becoming a guitar player, a lead guitar player. And I, at this point, I've already probably been playing for two years, but uh, I went out and bought one immediately, and I basically taught myself how to play guitar solos. So what I would do is I would go home, and I would get a riff to, you know, uh, a song uh, or a guitar solo that I wanted to learn. And I started with easier stuff. And you know, when you're a musician, you quickly realize when you try and play somebody else's stuff who's good. And who's, well, I don't want to say not good, but like some songs are more difficult to play than others. And while I was obsessed with Ozzy Osbourne, and I still am, I love Ozzy Osbourne's music, turns out his guitar players are pretty good and a little too advanced for me at the time. So I went to some of my more classic rock roots, um, ZZ Top, ACDC, Kiss, uh, you know, stuff like that. And I would loop the guitar riff. And then I would just sit there and listen to the song and figure it out by ear, note for note for note. And it took a while, but I learned. And then it got to the point where, okay, this stuff's too easy for me. I need faster. And that's actually how I became a metalhead um, because I was never a metal guy. I remember the first time I listened to Metallica. I hated Metallica. My brother used to play it all the time. And I was like, turn that crap off. Like, it's not for me. Turns out... You can grow into stuff. I love Metallica these days. Um, you might have noticed <laughs> on some of our music. And in the last day of grade nine, um, a buddy of mine asked me if I could play an Iron Maiden. This was the first time I also had really jammed with another musician before. And going from playing by yourself, just in your room, to playing with another person on another instrument, he was a drummer, Big game changer. I was said, Iron Who? I don't even know. I never even heard Iron Maiden. Well, I went home and I downloaded an Iron Maiden song. And I say I went home and I downloaded it, but where I lived, internet not so good. So it took about 48 hours and nobody could pick up the phone or it would interrupt the connection and we'd have to start all over. But I got it done and I listened to The Trooper for the first time and I was a converted man and obviously I'm a huge Iron Maiden fan now. Uh, my left arm is literally just a sleeve tattoo of Iron Maiden artwork, but that was it. And then I got tickets and they became the first band I ever saw live. An opening act, Motorhead, another opening act, Ronnie James Dio and Iron Maiden, 16 years old. And it was set, I was, that was it. I'm a guitar player, I'm a metalhead. I grew my, you know, that was that was it for me. I remember the first time I ever heard Ozzy Osbourne's Crazy Train, Randy Rhodes with that killer guitar tone and killer riff, and I remember saying, "Who was that? I want to learn that. I want to play guitar." And well, then I I did. And then right after that, the next moment of that aha moment was seeing Iron Maiden live, and I was like, "I want to play guitar for a living," because it was one of the coolest things that ever happened. And well. That was it. Next thing you know, I was a musician and uh, like a, became a professional musician fairly quickly out of out of high school at that point. And Bryson and I played in Creekwater Junkies for what six years. And I only took the time off of music, and that's a different story. I'm not going to talk about that. I still write. I still was writing and playing music all the time, but the music industry kind of, uh, you know, chewed me up and spit me out. Um, and I was a little jaded with it, and I thought I'm done with this crap, but. You know, turns out it doesn't really ever go away. And so now I'm back, but people ask me all the time, like, what's your, who are your influences? Like, you sound like a lot of different people. Well, there's a reason for that. So when I was learning how to play guitar, you know, I've got my loop pedal, um, and I could play the riff that somebody else had made, 
and I could sit down and learn the guitar solo somebody else had written. But one of my all-time favorite guitar players, Zach Wilde, I used to read guitar player magazines all the time. And he had some interviews that kind of changed my perspective and philosophy on learning the instrument. You know, I couldn't afford guitar lessons, so I wasn't taking those. So I wasn't learning from somebody else. I wasn't benefiting from their knowledge, but I also wasn't benefiting, or I wouldn't say benefiting, but like it is possible to be negative in the sense that you pick up on all their habits. And that's kind of what happens when you emulate your heroes a little too closely. My social circle of musicians, a lot of people really like Dimebag Daryl. You know, he was the popular dude at the time. Everyone sound, But everybody started to sound like Pantera clones. Um, or the other ones who are European metal fans. Like, everybody threw in sweep picking, which is a very common guitar technique um, in European metal. And that's all they would do. And I'm like, everybody's starting to sound the same. And Zach Wilde, in his interviews, always said, like, when he came in and he was 19 years old, going to play for Ozzy Osbourne, he knew he had to sound different if he was ever going to make it. And... And be an iconic guitar player. And he said, so look, tapping, that's Eddie Van Halen's thing. I can't do that. And I'm just going to sound like the next Eddie Van Halen clone. Uh, sweet picking next, that's Yngwie Malmsteen's thing. So he went out and consciously tried to find something somebody else wasn't doing and make it his. So I did the same thing. I took my loop pedal and I would just start learning little bits and pieces of all sorts of different guys that I admired from all sorts of different genres. Stevie Ray Vaughan, yeah, I'm going to learn some of your stuff. George Lynch? Sure, why not? You know, classic rock guys that are from bands that weren't even, you know, people think about Led Zeppelin. People think about, you know, some of those bands. I'm going to bands like Thin Lizzy, Boston, Tom Schultz, you know, stuff like that. That's where I was going to. Um, a lot of, obviously, metal. But I never got into sweet picking. I still don't do it. Um, I would go even sometimes to bluegrass and country and pick out little bits and little bits at a time. And then I would take scales, really simple scales. This is the Zach Wilde influence, the minor pentatonic, the blues scale, a few other ones. And I would just put a blues riff on that loop pedal and I would loop it and I would just jam to it with the scale running up and down the scale for hours. And I would just start playing with the timing of the notes or different note combinations, different runs. So I knew a lot of people that could sit down and play somebody else's stuff because they've heard it. But I'm like, can you ever write your own? Can you make it up on the spot? And even with Creekwater, the band Bryson and I used to be in, we would play bar sets to supplement our income because bar gigs paid better than original gigs. Uh, so we'd have four hours of material of cover songs. But when it came to playing guitar solos, I always made them up. I made my own. And I got really good at improvising on the fly as a result. Um, for those, all those hours put into it, just sitting there with a loop pedal playing over top of riffs and getting a sense of rhythm and timing as a guitar, as a lead guitar player, and then just doing it every night um, live. So you'd see, you know, we do songs like Freebird. You know, that song's pretty much a long guitar solo. All improvised, all made up on the spot, with the exception of a few parts that are kind of, you know, this is when that happens. That's when we change the, to this part. So it, my style is kind of a result of me consciously trying to be my own person. And, you know, while I'm probably not technically the best guitar player out there because, well, I don't know music theory. There are techniques that I never bothered to learn. I can create music that I'm happy with. And as a result, you know, there's a lot of unique. A lot of my influences are European. So writing music and I'll talk about that in another episode because my influences as a musician are obviously very different when it comes to writing a song versus well how did you learn guitar how did you learn to sing who did you emulate as a singer like a lot of my favorite musicians are actually singers despite the fact that I was never a singer myself and writing like who's your favorite songwriters that's a different skill in itself as well so we'll talk about that later but as a guitar player um, it was a conscious effort to sound different. And so with influences from like in Canada where we are and North America, like bands have a certain sound in certain genres. But if you go to Europe, they sound completely different. Well, most of my influences are European. So as a result, there's a lot of stuff that we do here that is unique to the scene. But I'm also heavily rooted in blues music, which is a North American sound. 
So it kind of, it just kind of worked out. Anyways, I've rambled on a little bit here. Uh, it is my birthday. I want to enjoy this martini before it's too warm. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at that. I hope everybody is having a good year so far. I can't believe that it's mid-January already. Um, but we got some stuff coming. Like I said, I keep saying that. It's like, yeah, yeah. Well, I got some paperwork I got to do tomorrow. I'm not going to do anything else um, musically related today. I'm going to enjoy my birthday. But uh, we got some stuff coming. So pay attention and, uh, you know, have a, treat yourself to a nice drink. Uh, check out the Crowbar on our website. I know this is the featured drink this week, but uh, I will be adding other recipes that aren't the featured drink at the same time as well. So there's a gin bramble on there. Uh, really, really good if you like uh, blackberry. Uh, really good drink. So check it out. Find something you like. Again, every week there's going to be new stuff coming. We got new content coming. We're going to be doing some stuff with our mailing list. So sign up to that. And when I say that, do it now. Don't wait because there will be some stuff coming. So as, as always, guys, dare to be different. Create cool shit, and we will see you next week on the podcast. Cheers.